Hello and welcome to the Sports Blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesby here with you. You can tweet me at rbowlesbyjr. You can tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STL SN. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Greater STL One Word Sports Network. You can also find us on our live account on Ustream. That's Ustream.tv. The channels are Bowlesby JR. We're going to talk about the Rams and the Cardinals. And then we're pretty much just going to go on some just whole different stuff after that. But I, when I did the football show this weekend, I really didn't think that there was a chance for the Rams to be the team that they were in this game. And you know their defense is good, but you didn't know how good. And you didn't know how the offense was going to fare with a new quarterback and not really thinking that he had any weapons. But your defense won you the game. You had some good special teams plays. You had some bad special teams plays. But your defense won you this game. I mean, according to the coach's tape, which isn't always believable, you go look at NFL.com, it said Donald had nine tackles. But a coaching tape, he had 11 tackles and two sacks. He had Brockers with 13 tackles, making that means he's making tackles on the inside. He had Quinn in there with two sacks. And without that defensive production, the offense didn't really wouldn't have really clicked. You also had a point off the special teams. You don't get the special teams play unless your defense is out there doing what they did. And then they also won you the game in overtime, stopping Marshawn Lynch on fourth and one. But I'm not going to complain about the offense at all. It was efficient. There was a couple of bad plays here and there. That first drive looked like it was going to be the same old Rams again. And then after that, they kind of moved the ball down the field. I mean, the rushing attack wasn't all that great, but it seemed like every time that Benny Cunningham ran, he got positive yards. Foles had the best quarterback, quarterback rating for the Rams in an opening game since 1992 at 115. He passed for 297, had a rushing touchdown and passing touchdown. That was on a go rock to Lance Kendricks. Something you didn't see with Sam Branch Bradford, I'm telling you that right now, is Lance Kendricks going on a go route. And Seattle's defense didn't even respect it. The guy fell down. Now you're saying now like we're saying if it's Kim Chancellor, maybe that play doesn't happen, but you never know. Does Cam Chancellor expect Lance Kendricks to go on a go route? You also had big plays from Jared Cook in this game who showed this last year in week one in Arizona and after that he was he was a Rams leading receiver but he was still just a nobody in this offense but he made big plays for you there was a couple passes that Foles threw bad to him that he caught there was one that should have been a touchdown that Foles kind of threw away from him and he had to make a great play out of bounds Foles also threw a bad pass to Tavon it should have been called pass interference but the ball was under throw, or that would have been a touchdown. But even with losing the turnover battle on offense, your offense still went out there and got you points. 20, 25 points on offense. But your defense made some big plays. Trey, Trey Truman Johnson, who got injured later in the game with a concussion, made a big interception. The penalties didn't happen either. And that's something you really seen. You've seen Greg Robinson get beat a couple times for sacks, but you didn't hear a lot about the penalties. And when you were looking at that Tavon Austin play and you were looking for flags, you're like, no flags, and all of a sudden it comes out late. Oh, no, it's the Rams again. And the penalty ended up being on Seattle. It seemed like a more disciplined team and things that Jeff Fisher said he was going to fix actually kind of got fixed. You didn't have the big deep threat play that this, the secondary usually allows. You didn't have a really a bunch of missed tackles in this game, which the Rams are known for. And you stopped one of the best rushers in the league. And you left 18 for 73, but no touchdowns. And then he got stopped in that fourth down. I talked on the football show that was on Sunday. is that I thought Russell Wilson was going to go off against this defense because... They usually let the quarterbacks run around on them that can run. But Russell Wilson in this game only had 30 run rushing yards. So obviously the Rams changed something there. 
that they seen and had someone actually looking at Russell Wilson while he's in the backfield. I mean, he was running all around. And usually them are plays he gets off on. But there was one play that, uh, if you looked at it, you thought he should have ran in the end zone. He threw it, and he threw it behind some random guy. And then you heard Daryl Johnson know Russell Wilson was smart to throw that ball because uh, Al Overtree was sitting in the flat waiting for him. And that's just something you just, it's, you would have thought that Russell Wilson would have ran right in and got another touchdown out of that. I ended up throwing a touchdown later, Jimmy Graham on a drive. But there were plays that the Rams didn't stop before. And they do have Seattle's number in the dome. I don't get it. But they do play Seattle tough all the time. I mean, it goes back to when Bradford lost that game in his rookie year for the Seahawks to go to the playoffs at 7-9. and nine. And he really didn't use, lose them the game. He threw a great pass to Denario Alexander, and it went right through Alexander's hands. So, it just seems like it was just a whole different Rams team out there. And a lot of people mentioned last year said Quinn wasn't getting the sacks and stuff because Chris Long wasn't out there. Now, you did see Chris Long, get a, you didn't see him get a sack, but he led the team in hurries. So, it proves that certain guys do make a difference on this defense. And having a healthy quarterback obviously helps something on this offense. I mean, he only had 45 rushing yards from Benny Cunningham. Isaiah fumbled. Isaiah Pete fumbled on, like, I think his second attempt. I mean, Tavon had a rushing touchdown. He was in the backfield a lot. But you, it wasn't like you were really moving the ball running it. And Benny Cunningham actually had 77 reception yards in this game. So, I don't know what to expect now. And Quick wasn't even out there. And that's a guy that I said on the football show that probably would make the biggest difference in his offense. But instead it was Jared Cook, Lance Kendricks, and Benny Cunningham. And we haven't had a running... Like, Steven Jackson in the last few years wasn't that running back that could... He fought, but I don't know if people had his number or this was a, just a bad defensive line. So... It seemed like every time Benny got close to the first down, he got it. And he fought for yards every time he got the ball. And it was just, it just seemed like it energized the whole offense. I mean, it doesn't really, not having your having your defense played as well as they do, probably energize them too, getting all the sacks. But it's just something that I just, we I don't think anybody expected to see. I mean, 34 points against the best defense in the league. According to everybody. And yeah, you allowed to 31, but the offense only, our defense only allowed 16. One was a special teams play and one was a fumble recovery for a touchdown. So, just think if them two things don't happen and you stop Seattle on them two drives, but I'm not saying you would. But this game could have been, it would have been 31 because they wouldn't have went to overtime, but 31 to 16. It didn't really look like that you were dominating this game, but they actually were. I think the Rams only had 53 offensive plays, but had over 80 defensive plays. And it helps when you get a special team touchdown. That cuts out drives right there and puts your defense right back on the field. But the, the Rams stopped a lot of you know, got the Seattle to third down a lot. And I think at one point, the Rams had only had four third downs, and Seattle had 11. They were four for 11 at the time. So maybe that doesn't say that you're all too efficient on defense if you're running twice, you know, really a quarter of winning plays as your offensive running. But that's how efficient the offense was. And that's something you haven't had. And it was something that going in this game, and you see the Rams were still running the same plays, playing the first rushing play of the game was Tavon Austin, and he lost eight yards. You thought it was the same old Rams. But then the screens are very effective. Tavon did make a couple big plays running in the ball. 
but you made other guys factors in this game that aren't usually factors on this team and Kendricks and Benny Cunningham. And this could show a whole different offense when Mason and Gurley get healthy because if you're basically using your running game without always using your running game, that's going to open up the big plays like the deep ball to Kendricks. And maybe that opens up the deep plays to Tavon, which you almost had one, and Nick Foles underthrew it. So, if you bring back Gurley and Mason, I don't know how you would use them the same way, but it seemed like the screen plays worked a lot for the Rams, and the dumped offs worked a lot for the Rams. And it would seem like a more open offensive scheme, something that you didn't expect with the draft pick they made. And having a big back like Benny Cunningham in there. So. The only thing that you can really say is about this game is the Rams had to cut down the turnovers. Three lost fumbles. Foles with two and P with that big one. But there was no, I mean, the special teams. I mean, that's going to happen every now and then. You, don't, you, you really would rather see it, I guess, in the first game is still win. But the Rams have been pretty good on special teams. And your best special teams player actually got hurt on that play in Chase Reynolds. So you were basically down to nine guys because you didn't really count Johnny Hecker as a tackler. So, I mean, that hurts you there. You, you shouldn't allow them kind of plays. But in the long run, you got right back with it with the Tavon Austin play. Now, you basically won the game because of a botched Squib kick, P. P Carroll called it, I guess, or a, where he was trying to kick the ball to a certain spot. But I, I just the way the guy even kicked it, I, I mean, I was he, I think he was trying to be play around with the special teams game, and he got caught on it. And really, the Rams should got an extra fifteen yards because their guy called a fair catch because the ball never hit the ground. And you can't hit a guy after he calls fair catch legally. So with that, it led to a touchdown. Who's here to say? Rams won the game. Seattle had a chance there at the end, and the Rams defense stopped it. So good. I mean, all good game all around. According to me, when you you get kind of worried with Zerline out there having to kick. The longer extra points because he does shank the ball sometimes and he was perfect. You got the punt return touchdown. I didn't think I didn't really pay attention to all Hecker's punts, but he seemed fine to me. And then your defense with a six sacks. And then, then your two leading tacklers, Brockers and Donald, are your two guys in the middle, which is gonna open up big things for Robert Quinn and Chris Long. Alec Ogletree, and you've seen us it opened up things for Mark Barron and Will Marcus Joyner. And like I told you when they released Joanne Dunbar, that Mark Barron was had already stole that spot. And like I think Akeem Ayers was on the field for nine plays. Yeah, he's on the depth chart, but that's Mark Barron's spot. And I guess the Rams seen something where they thought that he would be efficient at doing that. And it's worked out for him. I mean, it started working out for him last year. So as you moved ahead to Washington, and you're going on the road there, Washington is without Deshaun Jackson, this is a game that you don't want to have a hiccup game. And keep this going. You hope the Rams don't fall back into the Rams mode as they were really cocky about beating the Seahawks and blah, blah, blah. And hopefully they don't fall into this lack of days of the world we're, we're better than the rest mode. Because I kind of want to see this team be good even with the little rumors out there. And then you come back to home and play Pittsburgh. And that's going to be a big rocking game in the Dome. Probably a lot of Pittsburgh fans. But it's still going to be a loud Dome. And it's going to be a place <clears throat> where Rams could steal or win. And then what I thought was going to be a possibly could be an 0-5, could be start off as a 3-0. and And that's just something that you didn't expect when you go into this game. But yet, 
That's how efficient this offense was. And then the defense pretty much didn't allow any big plays. They the up front did what they been doing for so long, but the back end actually held up. And now the Rams are one zero as they go into Week Two. Let's move on to the Cardinals. This what a woo Sunday was a big game. In your last ten, you're three and seven, and you've actually had a couple good starts in there. And two of them are against the Reds in this series. But you lost both of them games. Then you got the third one from Rocket to finally get one. And the offense finally kind of backed the pitching here for once. I mean, but some of the pitchers you lost to in these this last 10, this 3 of 7, J.A. Hat, Dan Heron. I mean, Jason Hamill's a better pitcher. But I don't call him a pitcher that you should have to worry about losing to. John Lamb, Michael Lorenzen, Anthony Delastani. And why some of the people are still in the lineup and batting in the positions that they're in is, is bothersome. Because you got a guy like Tommy Pham who's been hot. And the Mike Messini just... I guess you got to get John Jay going for the playoffs. You got to get him some time going. But it just kind of you were just kind of you didn't know where he was. He seemed lost, and players have done that on this team. Carlos Villanueva in the bullpen was gone for a while. Now other times it's worked for rest. Like Colt Wong was out for four games. Johnny Peralta's getting a lot of rest here lately. And it gets some guys that you might want to see on your playoff roster, like Greg Garcia. Who seems like he's took in, taken over uh, Pete Cosmos' backup shortstop spot and can really do something for you as a pitch hitter. You also now know that Piscotty's got to be somewhere on this roster. If he's not starting, he's got to replace somebody that's on the bench already or split time with Adams, which steals time from Moss and Reynolds. But when you look at when he when Matheny puts these lineups together, it seems like sometimes he's just throwing the, light, the lifeboat out there and hoping to survive. I mean, one of the games got rained out, and that shouldn't really affect you. But you're going up against, and it was played the next day, so you see how it can come in, be lackadaisical, and Braxton allows a home run like that. And his last seven innings have been horrible. Eight hits, four runs. So I don't. there's, there's just something I don't see why they keep throwing him out there. Now you got Belial back, so that probably takes away from some of Brockton's C sex time. But you're playing some of the bad teams, and you started the series losing to some of the best teams in your division. Now you're losing to the bad ones. And you just hope this ain't gonna be a long stretch going, but I mean, you've got to become much happier today. Adams was in the lineup tonight against Milwaukee, and then Holiday, after running the bases, was activated. So you can see that somewhere in here, this offense is probably going to get somewhat better. But the starting pitching have been getting rocked of late. And it, you didn't know what was going on, and it's got to be a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of, you know, they're finally not pitching perfect anymore they they're missing some of their spots and you know you're getting late in the season you throw a lot of innings and Lynn said he was mad about his last start because they moved everybody back a day and it said it messed up his rhythm and he really didn't seem like a guy that needed it but like Michael Walker in his last start before Sunday was four innings six hits six hundred runs and it just wasn't a Michael Walker start and Finally, Garcia got roughed up. And then you had to start worrying about that. But you'd like to see that basically in the last three games, the pitching settled down a little bit. Lynn's start was a little rough, allowing a three-run home run to Schumacher, but he had a no-hitter going through five before that. So, that the hopefully the offense starts coming around as a pitching 
has calmed back down a little bit. But you still lost two of them games. You only won one. Lost three or four to Cincinnati. And now it's starting to tax this bullpen. I mean, a guy like Villanueva, even though, like I said, he was a ghost for a while. Now he's actually been getting in a lot of games. Over his last 15, 29 and two-thirds innings, 455 ERA. Over his last seven, 13, point, 13 and two-thirds innings, 724 ERA. 11 earned runs in that time. So I don't know what they noticed early in the season and that maybe to start working him more down towards the end of the season, maybe just start getting him loosened up for the postseason, but it hasn't worked. And he's still only got a 290-80 or 8, throwing 57 innings this year, which is one of the lowest months of his career. But when you put people in situations that they're not going to win, I mean bad things are going to happen. Having a guy like Choke that can't get anybody out. And when guys like Bainis start struggling, it's going to affect guys like Villanueva who has to come in there and try to clean up the usual cl cleaning up guys' mess. I mean, but the lineup hasn't helped you lately. Mosso for his last 21. Reynolds, one for his last 16. Peralta, two of his last 20. Eight of his last 49. So, <laughs> you're getting to a point where even if you put guys in a situation to give you a chance to win, the offense isn't helping you anyways. And, you, you, and you've noticed that if you've started to rest, Matheny's starting to rest guys and that are starting to get fatigued, but then he's mixing and matching. And when you put guys that aren't, Bat, capable of batting in the spots that you're putting them in, you're going to have not a very good lineup. It seems like, like I said, some of the lineups he just threw out the lifeboat out there. But you know if Adams is back in the lineup tonight, he's going to start getting a lot of time at first to get him back on track. If Holiday's activated, that's going to take away from some of the pitch hits from the other guys. I don't know if what Gritchick's doing. I don't know if he could still hit. But that should take away time from Reynolds and Moss. But then you, if they come back and they're all healthy sooner or later, where does that leave Piscotty? Now, I think it puts him in center field when Holiday comes back. But what about when Gritchick comes back? And how much playing time are they really going to want John Jay to get? Since Mike Matheny is so loyal to some of his players. But you kind of like seeing the little power surge of Carpenter. They're saying he can still do that. He's... But like I said, he's trying to find an in-between, which he should find an in-between because you can't have your leadoff guy batting 250. That's not the effect, best way to go. I mean, the Dodgers had a, their leadoff hitter batting 200 all year just because he had power. And maybe that's a good start off for the team. But he did hit a lot of doubles before. So, I mean, getting on base and VM. More I have to go in at pitches before two strikes is on the board. It's, he's got to find a happy medium with that, and so do we. <laughs> we got, in the, but the offense has to pick up. I mean, some of these games we lost over the of the last ten, the seven games where we had lost one nine to three, seven to one, nine to nothing, eight. To five and eleven to nothing. I mean, that's five of the seven losses, and the highest run total you scored was five, and that was after your you've already allowed eight of the runs. The offense tried to come back, and it didn't come all the way back, but it was a little pick me up there. But then, then you go out and lose eleven to nothing. So sometimes I just can't figure it out. And some of these guys are, I mean, I guess Peralta playing short was going to affect him. But some of these other guys with some of these injuries that have been out for so long. And even though they're not going to be fatigued, is it going to be kind of fatiguing to be playing in every game again? So now you got to mix and match some more as you're going into a stretch to where 
tonight, you could have your lead down to one game if you lose. So this probably ain't the time to go mixing and matching your lineups, but that's what the Cardinals had to do because of the injuries and the distance and non-production from really they what they thought was going to be their power hitters. So they start a big series in Milwaukee tonight on the road, and then they got three with the Cubs on the road who's fighting right behind you. But then you come back home on the 21st, and you got a series against the Reds again. And the two series in between... Uh, to the beginning series and the last series I read, some of those two series you have to win. Like, put a fight against up the Cubs, but if you win these two series, there's not much more that them other teams could do but keep on winning. So even if you lose a bunch of games to the Cubs, but you win these two series, now the Cubs have to go out there and win every game, and they're playing the Pirates in the series where you're playing the Brewers. So how far back will they be after that? All right, we'll take a break, and we'll come right back on the sports blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. Hello and welcome back to the Sports Blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bowlesby here with you. You can tweet me at RBowlesbyJR. You can tweet the Greater STL Sports Network at Greater STLSN. All right, let's get into it with weird news. As in Bangkok, police say authorities got to the bottom of a thief when a doctor pulled a six-carat gemstone from the ladies from a large attested of a woman. The gemstone, worth two hundred seventy-eight thousand dollars, was stolen from a fair where surveillance cameras caught the woman. And a Chinese man switching the stone for a fake stone after asking to inspect it. The dealer at the booth also identified the two that took the gem. The two initially denied involvement with the egg, but x rays showed a diamond like substance in the woman's body. And it was, as I read that story, Father also said they tried everything before they had to pull it out. They tried laxatives and everything to try to get it out of her body. And wow, if you would have got away with 278000 I mean, that's almost worth it. And who takes this $278,000 gemstone to a fair? I mean, if I got $278,000 worth of something, I'm going to, like, some kind of, like, bank vault or something to, if you want to see the stone. I'm not just sitting out there at some fair where I have to be caught on security, where the guy has to be caught on security cameras doing it and... They almost got away. They were on their way to the airport. So, the crazy things even happen in Bangkok. An American Airlines flight, this is back in the States now. Let's go back to the States. An American Airlines flight actually flew an unauthorized plane from L.A. to Miami last month. This mistake, which was first reported by an aviation blogger and later confirmed by CNN, violated Federal Aviation Administration regulations. Since the Airbus A-12, 20 or 3215 aircraft did not have the required extended operation certification to long distance travel over water. The certification requires that the planes that fly long routes with no alternative landing locations carry extra oxygen and extra fire suppression canisters. The August 31st flight, AA Flight 31, arrived safely in Honolulu before an American Airlines spokesman told. But an American line spokesman told CNN that the ground noticed the mistake halfway through the flight and immediately notified the FAA and the flight crew. And that's why I'm never getting on a plane. Because what if they would have got stranded or something like that or they would have had some kind of, I don't know, some kind of oxygen emergency going over the water, compression or whatever. And, and you... The 
like, were there people on a plane that they didn't know where they were going? They've seen some water and they were like, uh, yeah, cool. I wonder how many people got off the plane and stayed in Hawaii. That'd be kind of cool. Just end up in Hawaii randomly. But that's why I'm never going on a plane. I mean, it just don't make no sense. It really makes sense to even think about going on a plane when things like this can happen. To where the plane crew should have known where they were going and they still just, eh, let's go to Miami. All right, let's come back to the whole front. Is in Missouri, an auto man has been charged with stealing an ambulance parked outside at an ER in St. Louis County. Mark Ferry, 36, of the first block of, get this, Ozark Hills Mobile Home Court, was charged Saturday with stealing a motor vehicle and second degree burglary. Ferry was jailed in lieu of a $20,000 bail. Police say Ferry told a or took an unlocked ambulance parked outside Anthony's Medical Center. An hour later, a resident of Farabetta State's called police to report a Kirkwood ambulance parked in her driveway. An officer arrived and noticed a broken window at the rear of the woman's house and called for backup. A police officer and a dog found Ferry hiding in an upstairs bedroom. During the rest, the dog bit Ferry on his arm. He was found with the keys to the ambulance in his pocket. <laughs> Ferry returned to was returned to St. Anthony's for medical treatment of the dog bite. And you heard where he was from. Ozark Hills Trailer Park. That that tells you the whole story right there about what goes on. When you're just messed up. You decide to steal the ambulance and go rob some lady's house in the ambulance, which I guess cops don't drive around, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It just <laughs> to go steal an ambulance, and it's I don't. What are you thinking? Like, what could you possibly be thinking to go and steal an ambulance? I just, I don't get it. I just, I just don't get. It. And that's that's Missouri. That's Arnold, Missouri for you. All right, let's get into it with the hometown rundown. As the Rascals started their Frontier League playoffs in a one card wild card game at home at TR Heels Ballpark in O'Fallon against the Florence Freedom. Despite falling down two to nothing and five to two, the River City Rascals. Scored four undurned runs in the eighth inning to win six to five. Then they started a three-game series at home. The divisional series against the Southern LA Miners, and they lost game one five to three. After the Raggles came back down from three to nothing to tie the game, the in the eighth, but in the ninth, the Miners hit two home runs off of the closer Vince Bengerte to win the game. In Game 2 at Rent One Ballpark in Marion, Illinois, the Rascals tied the series with a win 7-2. Joe Santos started the game and pitched seven innings with one run, five hits, four Ks, and one walk. The Rascals scored three runs in a second to take the early lead, including a home run from Zach Kamatai. And in the deciding game of the series at Went One Ballpark, two grand slams by Josh Silver led the Rascals to the Frontier League Championship for the fifth time in seven years. And the win 9-5. They would face Traverse City Beach Bums in a rematch of the 2010 series. The series starts tonight on the road for the Rascals. But with games 3 and 4, game 4 if necessary, come back to a final and T.R. Hughes ballpark on the 18th. So it's kind of cool to see one of these little independent teams that are out there. And they obviously... Give you entertaining ball, 56-40, and 40, and now they're in a championship. You'll get to see at least one game of the five-game series. Hopefully the Rascals win both of them, and if they win one, then you get to also see game four out there in O'Fallon. So go support one of the independent teams, and also support this one at St. Louis FC in front of a record count at Worldwide Technology Park and Fitton. Shout out to Sarlene Independence on September 12th, so, 2 to nothing. With the win, St. Louis FC's record is now 7-11-9, 27 points. In the 29th minute on a rebound after a shot from Brian Gall, James Musa put up C up 1 to nothing. And less than 10 minutes into the second half, FC scored again on a header from Jacob Bushu that made it 2 to nothing. And that's how the game ended. Goalie keeper Alex Kyle made one save for his second shutout of the season. And the win. St. Louis FC wraps up its inaugural season against Louisville City FC at home. At Worldwide Technology Park, Saturday, September 19th at 7.30. So it doesn't sound like they're going to make the playoffs there in the USL, but 
And they put a little entertaining game on for you. Last game is if you watched the game, it was actually it seemed like they went 90 minutes finally of offense. And you haven't really seen that from St. Louis FC as it seems like they're usually in the second half. They shut down like halfway through it and they usually allow a lot of offensive pressure which leads to a lot of goals against. So it was nice to see them go out there and kind of have basically the ball for the whole second half it seemed like. Now this is why I said we're going to get in a lot of randomness today. As I find a couple stories about the New York Yankees. And one I actually heard a couple of weeks ago on the damn Patrick show talking about it. But I kind of wanted to go at it too. Then I got another crazy one on the Yankees coming after that. But this one, first from the New York Daily News, Anthony McCarron, he wrote it on September 19th. Or August 19th, excuse me. In the middle of a contentious contract negotiation with Derek Jeter in 2010, Yankees GM Brian Cashman told the pinstripe icon that he would prefer to have Troy Tulalinski playing shortstop the next season, according to the new SIPs of Cashman. The story written by S.L. Price says that in one of their final face-to-face meetings, Jeter asked the GM, who would you rather have playing shortstop this year rather than me? Cashman replied, do you really want me to answer that? <laughs> Given the go-ahead, Cashman named Troy Tulalinski, the then to start with the Rockies, and was prepared to rattle off a list of other names, the story said. Cashman also added, we're not paying extra money for popularity. We're paying for performance. The moment was diffused, and the two sides eventually agreed on a three-year deal worth $51 million. Cashman also called Jeter the greatest player I will ever had, I will ever have in the story. But the price profile also says that Cashman was impatient with what price rights were Jeter's, Jeter's diva-like tendencies, and the GM enjoyed being one of the few people to tell the captain no. Reached by phone Wednesday, Cashman said of the Tulo and the Tulo thing, I, I don't know what I wrote there, I don't provide the information, I didn't confirm or deny it. He Price asked me about, about it, I said it was pr- a private meeting. But Cashman asked, if players ask me questions, I will answer directly and honesty. Honestly. So it kind of sounds like it might be true, but you'll see. Ask about the diva-like tendencies price words, not Cashman's. Cashman said, I didn't say diva-like tendencies. It's a piece he wrote. He put it together. You'd have to ask him about that. There's no quotes about that for me. He did a lot of homework. (laughs) Does Cashman have any issues with the story? No, I don't have any problems with the piece. There's what's letting you know it's probably true. Cashman is portrayed as frank and is quoted saying, sometimes honesty hurts. But if you're being paid to do a job, do the job. You have to honor the job description. If not, you're a fraud or stealing money. You can't fake your way doing this. You either do it or you don't. The story also noted that Cashman was embarrassed in his 2013 quote saying of Alex Rodriguez about the whole steroid thing. Alex should just shut the F up. I think I handle my, I handle myself in a professional manner most times, and that was one of the rare occurrences I didn't. Cashman said, "I said what I felt, but sometimes it's not to do. It's best not to do so. That's a that's all territory covered already. Not my best moment. I've had a few of those. Kind of, you see, it hurt. He said he seeked kind of an enjoyment of being able to tell dear Jeter no, and the diva like tendencies." I mean, he should run the show. He is the captain. So I guess he should run the show if he's going to be that kind of player and be adored like he was by all the managers and the people he played with. And really, never heard a bad thing about the guy. But three one three years for fifty one million. I mean that's that's paying for past performance. I mean Derek Jeter didn't play that bad in his past few seasons where he wasn't maybe wasn't the best shortstop in the world. But he played better than some guys do now, Sterling Castro Castro for one. But another great Yankee story that came out was a Yankee club former clubhouse worker wrote a tell all book on his happenings during the years he was there as a as a uh, assistant equipment manager, and the book is called "Abused by the New York Yankees," and this is some of the claims that this guy claims in his book. 
Derek Jeter and Jorge Posada engage in a sexual relationship in a clubhouse sauna at the end of their first season with the team. Jeter Persona then allowed Paul Piore, writer of the book, to perform oral sex on them in order to keep him quiet. So he said, hey, I'll stay quiet about this if I can perform oral sex on you. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, this is, you're going to hear a lot of things. And it's supposedly a lot of the things about Steinbrenner is true, but a lot of the other things you heard are not. But this is, the, I mean, this is the first one. The first one, he, Derek Jeter and Jorge uh, Posada thing. And they engaged in a sexual relationship. In the clubhouse sign where everybody could see, but they, I guess they knew everybody was gone except for this one guy who said, hey, I won't tell if I could do this. <laughs> All right, George Spin Diet Brenner spied on his players using secret security cameras in the clubhouse and was actually involved in the Iran Cantera affair. S sounds like a guy who has a lot of money and can influence people. I feel like Gerald Williams had sex with an underage concession stand worker in a storage closet. That happens to everybody, doesn't it? Cecil Fielder played drunk on vodka and Daryl Strawberry drank whiskey during games. Sounds about right for Daryl Strawberry. I don't know about Cecil Fielder, but uh, maybe that was his way of hitting home runs. Now, this is where it gets... So this is another funny one. Bob Wickman, Jeff Nelson, and Mario Venner tried to sexually assault him with a baseball bat. I mean, but if he's asking people for... to give them what he... That, I mean... But it is a crazy claim, I mean, and... You would think that crazy stuff happens at the clubhouse, but I mean, with the random equipment guy, I mean, nah. Bat Boys also created a market of forged autographs on Yankees memorabilia. I hope they did. That would be that would be a pretty smart thing to do. Now, Gary Tushnik, who is Perry's co-writer and Perry, have taken their promotional book tour to places as the U.S. Attorney, Attorney General's office and the office of Congressman Elijah E. Cummings, among others, urging them to investigate. The, dupli the duplications and unethical business practices of George Steinbrenner from the time he purchased the team with partners in 1973. George Steinbrenner, a twice convicted felon, had ordered his office staff, who dealt with financial matters, to keep two sets of books, one official and the other temporary. The temporary set was routinely and systematically destroyed. Perori observed office staffers carting boxes of papers to the stadium basement where the papers were dumped into a large metal container and incinerated. He said the number of staffers had discreetly revealed to him the instances of so-called dummy corporation. Furthermore, in 1996, Perori observed three levels of gambling in the Lakey's clubhouse. Manager Joe Torre, now MLB executive, and coach Dom Sim Zimmer regularly sent Bat Boys, aged 14 to 16, with Yankees identification to a nearby off-track betting office to place ragers on horse races. A Bat Boy linked to the bookie regularly placed wagers on sporting events for players and employees during the game in the clubhouse using a phone connected to the stadium switchboard. And at least on one occasion, players were observed and heard betting on themselves to lose the game. They would play that day, which Peoria discreetly recorded on audio tapes. They won the bet, and the bookies' runny, runner delivered the winnings. Most nights, after stadium games on duty, NYPD cops joined with players and employees, including Bat Boys, to gamble on poker and blackjack card games. Alcohol was freely consumed. Well, you can see them doing the, the blackjack and all that. But there are some crazy things to try to go with the biggest franchise, well, at least baseball franchise out there. And I don't know if they have to sign some kind of confidentially agreement. You don't hear a lot of stories like this coming out. But just put this out there, and I mean, you could have lawsuits and all kinds of stuff. And I, I wonder if these guys really, this guy really hesitates to prove it because. The Steinbrenners probably won't bother with it just because it's really not going to affect their business probably if people read this book. I mean, it's not getting out there as a big selling book. Yeah, I, that was the first time I heard about it was when I read this story on Deadspin. 
But it's crazy that a guy will come out and say that and then put people's names to it. Like Jeter, Posada, Steinbrenner, Rivera, Nelson, Wickman. And them guys probably don't have the money that Posada, Jeter, and Mariano Rivera do. So they, you know, you might have a lawsuit there to say, what the hell are you talking about, kid? He also claimed in there that Yankees fired him because he was HRV positive and stuff like that, which the Yankees and courts didn't agree with. So you can tell this guy's probably trying to make a quick buck. And might be have died into the story a little bit. Maybe he had one too many drinks one night and had one too many dreams. So that was a lot on the Yankees right there. Usually don't do that too much. But uh, we'll move on to the UFC as the Nevada State Athletic Commission on suspended has suspended UFC right away Nick, Nick Diaz for five years for his third marijuana related offense of his career. The SAC discussed a lifetime ban for Diaz 32 before voting unanimously for the five year ban. NSAL Commissioner or NSA, NSAC Commissioner Skip Avancio acknowledged during deliberation a five year ban is essentially a lifetime ban for Diaz. Diaz appeared before the commissioner in person but declined to answer any of its Questions Commissioner Paul Lundeveld forced Diaz to verbally plead the fifth through a long series of approximately 30 questions. Immediately after the hearing, Diaz spoke to the media. I'm pretty pissed. I got into this sport for this exact reason, being stuck in a room with people like that. I wanted to tell them I think I wanted... I wanted to tell them what I think. I wanted to tell each and every one of them they're a bunch of dorks. Everybody who sees them or knows them, who anybody anybody who sees them or knows them, who they who should tell them that I would if I weren't for my experts advised me to keep my mouth shut. I wanted to get up and say, "Look at you! Look, you guys are way the f out of line." Lucas Middlebrooks, Diaz's lead attorney, said he will appeal the five-year suspension. The Nevada State Athletic Commission also fined Diaz one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Now, how long, I don't know how long, but how long do they suspend steroid guys for? I mean, I understand it was a third time. And they, they claimed a lot of his history with getting in fights that weren't, you know, supposed to fight in the ring without, with the fights that weren't supposed to be fights, like fight when he fought in strike force with Jason Mann Miller. But how long, I mean, I know there's some guys that tested positive for USC and steroids. I mean, how long do they get banned for? And it's, I mean, it's kind of going at the wrong way to suspend a guy that long for marijuana. I mean, is it really affecting him that much? I mean, I guess they could say somewhere in there it can make him make rash decisions or something like that. But, I mean, that, I mean, you also find him 165000 So, I mean, you got into his pocket, you mean, so you have to get into the way he makes money? And so I don't know if that just means he can't fight in Nevada. I, I mean, does that affect him from fighting anywhere else? I didn't see that part in the story, but I mean, you take a guy's life away and then also find him money for it after you're taking five years of what he's going to make money on. I mean, I don't think that's the way to go about it. I mean, I think they're sending the wrong message and saying, hey, we can take your life away, but also try to take your money. So this... We'll see how this goes on, and they'll probably knock it down to two years or something, but still have to pay the fine. You'll see something like that probably go on. You'll see if maybe the UFC maybe comes out for him, and that might sway the decision a little further. Well, there was a fight on Saturday, I guess you could call it. It was a boxing match between Floyd Mayweather and Andre Berto. As Andre Berto said, I should have wore track shoes. But, this, I mean, Mayweather actually... In the first two rounds, actually tried to throw a little punches. And I think he probably got hit a couple times and was like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. And, I mean, it looks like a good fight for the first few rounds. And then Mayweather basically ducked and dodged and did his usual Mayweather thing. I don't know what else people expected. Definitely when he was going for a record. You thought maybe he would go after him enough to knock him out. But you never really know what Floyd Mayweather is going to do in a fight. Definitely with all that, all the running around that he actually does do. 
But he also, you know, he, he'll he get in there every now and then there and try to attempt to get you to throw a bad punch and then go for the knockout, which he did a few times, mostly in the first few rounds. But you got to expect that when he feels like he's tiring out, he's going to go to where he's best at, and that's maneuvering against you. So he tied Mike, Rocky Marciano for the record at 49-0. and Said he's going to retire after that. Can't really see it because you could probably make a hundred million dollars again off of fifty and zero, and do whatever you want. I mean, the guy's made enough money, but hey, what's another million if hundred million if you can make it? As Stan Kroenke. Uh, so I mean, it was a good fight for a little bit there. You kind of got the point. The fight that nobody made whether it was gonna win. Or nobody to me. All right, now we'll move on to something that's was bound to happen. Because it happened to the Poker Stars websites and all that, even though that was a whole different thing with things going to offshore accounts and blah, blah, blah. But the funny thing is who it came from, and this came from a New Jersey governor where all the gambling stuff is allowed, like it is in Las Vegas. But a New Jersey Democrat fake Pallone user called a congressional hearing into the relationship between the NFL and fantasy leagues. Mainly the ones that bought up all the airtime for commercials on week one of the NFL. Polano said anyone who watched the game this week and was inundated by commercials for fantasy sports websites, and it's only the first week of the NFL season. These sites are enormously popular, arguably central to the fans' experience, and professional leagues are seeing their enormous profits as a result. Despite how mainstream the sites have become, Though the legal landscape governing these activities remains murky and should be reviewed. Pallone asked the Energy and Commerce Committee for a review of the league's legal status, in particular how the league, which offers cash prizes to fans who pay to join, differ from sports betting, which is not illegal in all states, of course. Online sports betting and online gambling are prohibited under federal law, but the leagues are taking advantage of a loophole that has become known as the Fantasy Sports Carve-Out, According to Pallone, the loophole had blurred the lines between betting conducted through fantasy sports fund sites and online gambling. Fans are currently allowed to risk money on performance of an individual player. How is that different from wagering money on the outcome of a game? Pallone said in a statement. Now you can go find this, the whole thing. It's like nine pages that he wrote to this Energy and Commerce Committee. And it's, I don't understand why you, you would go after something, that, and it's probably because they're not making somewhat of money off it, it's not taxed or something like that, blah, 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 as usual, the government's trying to watch everything. But this is what happened to the poker websites when they couldn't figure out how to, how to for them to make money off it and shut it down on what was called Black Monday, where the poker stars and full tilt and all that shut down. Now, the one site that they should be looking at that they that's not mentioned here is Bovada. Because you can parlay games and do that all there, and someone's going to hate me for saying that. He's also going to hate that I read this story. I don't know if he heard this story yet. Uh... Johnny, so make sure, Johnny, you listen all the way through the end of the show. But <laughs> it is kind of different than playing poker and basically gambling online, I guess. Because but, but, but the difference is, why can you do it at the casino? And with this, you're really not betting on the game. You're almost betting on, I guess, 10 players. You're almost betting on 10 games at times. And it's really not the outcome of the game, it's the outcome of the player does. So how is it really betting all that much on the outcome of a game? And he doesn't really say anything like this, but is he basically saying that the performance of the individual player, somehow he could get paid if he had a good or bad fantasy game? But to go after this when you're one of the states that allow the gambling, why would you even worry about it? 
other than to somehow worry about how the money's affecting you or how they're not paying taxes. Because these leagues have been going on forever. FanDuel's been around for years. And I don't know how long DraftKings has been around, but it's been around for a while now. And along with, there's other ones. I don't know if they've shut down yet, but Draft Day. Bravada's another one that you can bet games and stuff like that. You can sometimes, I don't know if you can play for real money. I know you can look at poker and stuff on there too. They also got bet in UFC. I think they have that on DraftKings now where you can do the UFC fight. Which is just crazy. <laughs> you would go even go through that. I mean, that'd be a hard decision. I wonder if how many other fights you have to pick. But again, taking something that kind of makes football a little more fun, and of course, and trying to take it away from us. I mean, that's how the blackout rule basically ended, and people got mad. And now people are getting mad over not being able to have. Every single game on the direct TV crap. Because if you pay for it, why shouldn't I have it? And he's really trying to compare this to more of gambling than it really is. I guess because you're risking money it before it's a way of gambling. But it's basically just what it says it's fantasy sports. And why was it never checked out before? Because fantasy sports has been around since I can't remember the internet being around. It just wasn't one week every week. It was you played a 16 week season and this is how you did it. So is he going and I actually see when I read some of the things that like Yahoo Sports was going to start putting out a one week thing kind of like the draft days and all that does and they've been running their little fantasy thing for a long time with a 16 week season that's the ones I used to play on now I moved on to ESPN and the NFL network yeah but then even the NFL has one so I if you kind of read it it kind of he's kind of more worried about how much the NFL is making off of it and how they're making so much money to buy up these commercials that are supposedly worth so much money But what I didn't see is that in week one, that's probably the time you wish to hit it because that's when it actually you start rolling. You don't get to play in preseason. You hit all the commercials week one. You get everybody involved. Boom, you make the money. But I guess he didn't really enjoy watching the New York Giants or Jets game with all the draft days commercials. And maybe he's not a sports betting guy. Maybe he sees there's something wrong with it. There's always them kind of guys that see something wrong with something that doesn't bother nobody else. So we'll see how this rolls out and we move on. It's, there's been people saying that within a couple years this is gone. But I hope not because it, it's just another way to enjoy more than one game. And that's probably why the NFL is involved so much to get people on these packages. Because now I can, don't just need CBS and Fox. Now I need the Sunday ticket because all my fantasy guys are in there. So we'll see if the NFL status with it. Kind of makes this story die down a little bit. All right, that's going to do it. Make sure to tune in to the football show. We're going to move to Saturday night. I'm going to give you a time later. I'm Robert Bowlesby, and this has been the Sports Blog on the Greater STL Sports Network.